We've talked about the founders of the city before, people like William Mulholland and Henry Huntington, whose wealth and drive helped make... And Harrison Gray Otis. And Harrison Gray Otis, obviously. Walrus man. <laughs> he was the walrus. <laughs> their wealth and their drive helped make huge advancements. They turned a sleepy little Pueblo town into a modern American city. <laughs> into an exhausted little... <laughs> <laughs> Put me to bed. But these men really don't hold a candle to the Chandler, starting with Harry, who is truly responsible for so many essential elements to the city, him and Harrison Gray Otis. Right. Professionally, he is succeeded by his son Norman and then his grandson Otis. And there is cro- there is overlap between what I was talking about and Harry coming yeah. in also. Uh, you should have called this one a Harry situation. Harry and the Harrisons, that's it. That's pretty funny. All this influence over the city made possible by their positions at the LA Times. Harry Chandler was born in May of 1864 in Landaff, New Hampshire. He was a descendant of William Chandler, who immigrated from England to Massachusetts in 1637. Hmm. That is a crazy long time ago. That's old white people. That's old That's old white people. <laughs> Harry's parents were listed in the census as being workers in a bobbin factory in 1880. It's a bobbin factory. I couldn't find out too much about like bobbin what, pins? I couldn't find out too much about Harry's childhood, but it is known that as as a small child, Harry would earn money working as a model for a local photographer. Weird. So it's 1882, and Harry... Is he the one in those centerfolds that they were printing in yeah, the Times? He's, uh, yeah, he was like old-timey cartoons where it's just like a butt through those old-timey pajamas that have yeah. the buttons. Get a load of this. And that, and people thought it was so funny. Butts little, are the funniest thing. It's 18... Only they were pills to get your butt hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the that hardest would butt be I've funny. ever seen. 1882, and Harry is in his late teens. He, now he just arrived at Dartmouth to get an education, mm. but not too long into his college that's years. That's a white school. <laughs> that's a super white school. It's his college years. He's a young man, and he does the most college thing. He does a keg stand. He does a keg stand on a longboard going to class. Um, a classmate of his <laughs> dared Harry to dive into a vat of starch that had frozen over in the first cold snap of the season, which S- it's described as like an icy crust. Starch? starch. Like potato starch? Like, I guess so, yeah. That was fun for an old white family. In yeah, in 1882 in Dartmouth. Yeah, Dartmouth. <laughs> I bet you own two something stupid. Probably will. And probably will indeed. He accepted the dare and must have thought, I'm not an idiot. I would never dare do anything that would alter my entire life. I'm just going to jump into this freezing cold vat of starch. And he does. And he gets out and he he has his street cred intact, of course, but then he has a high fever and a hacking cough. This is followed by a hemorrhage of the lungs oh my God. from jumping into the vat of starch. He potato gets- fever. That was the first name of the potato famine was potato fever. And <laughs> we all get this guy a hot potato, but no one could get it to him because <laughs> kept dropping it. This is what he's going through. Hemorrhage of the lungs, number one. Number two, pneumonia. And even more upsetting to working class parents, number three, his withdrawal from college. Um, <laughs> the combination of freezing anything and yeah. also that you can't have that much starch around you. But also this sounds like what happened to George Bailey and It's a Wonderful Life. You're right. <laughs> it does. Th- oh my God. He fell, he fell into the frozen pond trying to save his brother and mm-hmm. then he lost his hearing that cause he couldn't go to war or whatever. He had um, to stay home. The threat of tuberculosis loomed over Harry Chandler after this incident. It was determined very quickly what he needed. I know to- a city he could go to. Uh, Santa Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> the jewel of the West. <laughs> it was determined very quickly what he needed to get over. This respiratory ailment was, like you said, sunshine. So it's the next the land year. of sunshine. Land of sunshine. Just buy a magazine. You don't need to leave. You don't need to leave Dartmouth. It's 1883. It's the next year. And the Chandlers put Harry on a train and sent him west to Southern California. Down- Wait, they didn't go with him? No. So they're very sick son. They're very the son. remedy is send him on a train alone, alone to, across the country to what we can only imagine is the wild west of the wild west where the sun never sets yeah. and then come back in like an hour like you just need to charge your batteries which don't exist <laughs> it meant something different back then you need to heat your coil <laughs> once in town he found a room in a downtown flop house over a short period of time he was thrown out of many boarding houses because of his hacking cough they didn't like to hear it but luckily while wandering around looking for work he ends up on the Coenga pass which was then part of the vast ranch of isaac van Nice. There he met a retired physician who also came to Los Angeles so the sunshine could cure his health. This man offered him room and board in exchange for manual labor in his orchard. What he, better thing for a guy with uh, pneumonia? Pneumonia and a to, hacking cough yeah. is to like, you want to be outside? Pick up a shovel. Sun. Start picking stuff up, stupid. <laughs> what are you, stupid or ugly? Uh, he wasn't ugly. He was a butt model. He'd be plowing and harvesting orange and grapefruit trees like on the fruit crate labels. He settled down and lived in a tent while working the fields. He broke horses, which means you just trained them to be ridden. It doesn't Picked mean them up. It dropped them. He harvested fruit for farmers in return for a share of their crops, which he then sold to threshing crews. So he was able to make his own money as Mm. well as earning room and board. He was able to start raising money to head back home when his lungs were cured. This life was a- He had to sell his lungs to make profit. This life was a far cry from the 
cush sweater tied around your neck life of a college boy. While he was staying here, Harry did not care for Los Angeles. He called Los Angeles a crude little frontier town. Oh, it's actually it's a sleepy wrong. little Pueblo yeah. town. <laughs> he's in town and he's not feeling great about it. He's feeling really lonely and homesick and regular sick. Pneumonia. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> Home pneumonia and regular pneumonia. You've got two illnesses. <laughs> Both are terminal. The cure for one is to stay here. The cure for the other is to go home. <laughs> so what do you pick? Wandering through the streets, he chanced to see into a window of a photographer and he was looking at these photos and a collection of a beautiful these beautiful little children these little cherubs <laughs> among these photographs was one of a little boy whispering into a little girl's ear and it was him as a child because he used to take photos as a model so, so he it's an odd experience he bought the picture and he claims that this was his cure to homesickness he was able to kind of make it through his stay in los By angeles looking at a picture of himself as being a baby? on the other side of the continent where you never expect to see yourself as a child and then you see yourself how think about how weird that is what that's a weird, weird coincidence okay. that would be but that's still weird like oh, i miss home better look at this picture of me as a baby i'm where i'm supposed to be must have okay. been the thought he yeah. was going through he was um, looking for a sign he was looking for a sign to and what he got was a picture actually do you have any signs <laughs> can you make a sign out can of you it? make a sign out of this he still wanted to go home but after some time you know like i'm not sure how long <laughs> this but picture will keep me going for a while he raised three thousand dollars doing manual labor stuff and he was able right. to go back east in 1884 and i'm not sure how soon his illness came back but many things i read used the word immediate or <laughs> immediately i bet you won't jump into that barrel of starch again <laughs> this train departs in a big vat of starch you okay with that <laughs> within the first year back his health declined and there was only really one answer for it again yeah. sunshine harry chandler headed back to los angeles to his destiny now it's 1885 and harry has to get comfortable in los angeles because he has to live here now he's now 21 years old and looking for a place to make some money upon his return he found a job that was less physical than his field work he found a job with the la times no readings i covered make this out to be a monumental decision or achievement there's no story there they were, like they were looking for someone and he was looking mm -hmm. for a job and that was it and he began working for the la times yeah. He began his newspaper career as a clerk in the circulation department, a truly humble position when you think about where his story goes. In 1888, Harry got married to a woman named Magdalena or May Schlater, who was the sister of fellow clerk at the Times. May and Harry had a daughter, Francesca. They lived on Roses Street near the old LA Times building. Wait, so he map. married this lady? This lady. Okay. That's not who he's supposed to marry. <laughs> you mentioned destiny before. That's not his destiny. His destiny is to marry the girl that whatever happens in is a wonderful life. I've, I've only seen it one time. To marry that mousy old librarian. That mousy old librarian. <laughs> oh no, what a cruel fate. She has a pension. <laughs> oh, oh, Mary, Mary, oh, Mary, Mary, give it up. Who made you wear his glasses, Mary? You look so dorky, Mary. Without a good husband in your life, you become a nerd. Mary! They were all compliments back then. Mary, you're a dowdy old loser, and I mean that <laughs> in the best possible way. Okay, so they're living in downtown and uh, walking distance to the Times building, the fortress. He then purchased several newspaper routes and began handling his own delivery and collections because at the time you could deliver as an independent contractor. So you could buy your own routes and deliver on your own and make your own money from okay. the paper. He hired carriers and he and his carriers delivered the papers in wagons every morning. They delivered on saddle horses and when bicycles came along, they did bicycles. They rode a bicycle on a horse. They, <laughs> they crossed the LA River in rowboats during floods, which we wow. know about. Yeah, well, they saved the horse. The rowboat was on the back of the horse who was drowning underwater. <laughs> he recalls even delivering papers to a young man hand drilling for oil at 2nd Street Park. Hmm. This man was Edward Doheny. Hmm. It's such like Los Angeles year one stuff. <laughs> yeah. In 1887, at the age of 23, he was promoted to circulation manager, and then he was promoted shortly after that to general manager. He also started buying stock in the Times. So it seems that the Times became his life. Just like Harrison Gary. the Times, they were a changing? Did someone make that joke already? Well, the Times <laughs> were a ch Oh, you just, we just did that. Um, soon enough, he got the attention of the big boss, Harrison Gray Otis, who admired the young man's discipline. He admired his drive. Handsome guy. He was described I like as the cut of your butt. <laughs> you might Which is a centerfold. Yeah. I opened up the paper and it was my butt. Uh, and I knew I was home. I knew that I, well, I belonged here. <laughs> Chandler was described as thrifty, calculating, and aggressive. What a compliment. What a, Those all meant nice the things three, back then. Nah, <laughs> the three things you want to be. This was his Twitter bio. He was sniveling. <laughs> <laughs> he was foul mouth. He did whatever I said. <laughs> One thing I read was that he wanted to crowd the competition, which was the Tribune, and he wanted to keep them busy so they wouldn't be delivering papers. His plot to do so was to arrange a picnic outing in the desert and invited a majority of the Tribune carriers to it, keeping them there happy and well fed but most Wait importantly <laughs> busy and far away so Harry Chandler did this. Yeah, he invited the delivery boys for the other newspaper into the desert for and a then, picnic. That's ridiculous. and it was like a legitimate picnic. And but, it was like you know a what? Good picnic. He's gonna make a great son-in-law <laughs> to Harrison Coyote. Slice off the old 
But <laughs> but <laughs> tragedy strikes in 1892 when Harry's wife Magdalena died suddenly from I've never heard of this before, so I'm probably gonna say it wrong. Pneumonia. Pneumonia. Peyuperal fever, which is an infection she got after childbirth. It's a, it's something that happens. An infection you get after she gave birth and the it. baby lived. Alice May and the mom didn't. Hmm. So his wife's dead. It's very truly sad. But the death of his wife led to a networking opportunity. When two years later he married the boss's daughter, yeah. Emma Marion Otis. He is now a husband again. His daughters have a new mother. But more importantly, I'm Harrison Gray Otis's son-in-law. <laughs> but this isn't to say that his promotion was based on nepotism. Chan- they, again, perfect for that family. They see a death and it's a power vacuum for them. What does this death mean for me? Yeah. Well, what I was saying was his promotion was not based on nepotism. Chandler's hustle got him recognized by the upper crust and now his placement in the family has solidified his destiny. The two men worked very well together. They worked alike. They thought alike. They both hated labor unions. Unlike Otis, though, Harry Chandler was very much against public appearances. He was not boastful and boisterous. Like He was prolific when it came to industry and business ventures, but despised discussing these ventures outside of business environments. He was like a sniper. Like, if Harrison Gray Otis is a machine gun cannon yeah. thing. It's a cannon filled with nails. <laughs> <laughs> Terry Chandler is like a sniper shot. This right. in the dark and just precise. <laughs> He's daggers in the night, which is another Lord of the Rings <laughs> reference. I'll walk. You don't think I will? They walked all the way to Mordor. <laughs> in 1910, the city's population has started to grow slowly, topping at about 32,000 people. Also, this is the year that the damn building blows up. The PE red cars were now operating all over the city from downtown to Long Beach. So we're now we were a proto city. Among the newcomers to LA was a young theatrical director, D.W. Griffith, along with a 16-year-old girl named Mary Pickford, who was making her first L.A. origins, hmm. year one. They were escaping the filming catastrophes of the East Coast climates. Among the movies he makes in the Valley, Birth of an Ancient. Uh, <laughs> listen to episode Better Business Broadcast for more on about that movie and what president... Did he film that in the Valley? He filmed it in the Valley. I bet I could pinpoint where. I bet it wasn't hard to drum up some clan outfits in yeah. the Valley. He just went to Silmar, the northern <laughs> part of Silmar. <laughs> Up by the hills. They have always been there. <laughs> Harry saw the potential of having films being shot in Los Angeles, so he took an active role in encouraging the hmm. movie industry to make Los Angeles a headquarters. Again, these people invented Los Angeles. Yeah, they invented. Harry Chandler in particular, the craziest thing is, like, he liked movies. <laughs> he just saw, how can I exploit this? How can, like, yeah. I'll, we'll get to it. He wanted Los Angeles to be the headquarters of such classics as Marley and Me and Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. There's a story behind his shady dealings. He made it his business to know how movies were shot and understood that artificial lighting had not reached the intensity required to photograph interior scenes, and therefore, camera and crew were relying on the sun. If you want to shoot indoors, it was like three walls and yeah. an open ceiling. So if you wanted a sunny day, you had to be in the sun and that's temperamental. Through the Times correspondent in San Francisco, Chandler was able to keep track of the weather and when a long period of fog settled over the bay, Chandler urged the LA Chamber of Commerce to send a mission north with a message that the sun was always shining in Los Angeles. So they found a film crew that was idle and disgruntled because of the fog and said how about we load up all your stuff in a train and we take all you guys to Los Angeles and you could film there because the sun always shines there pretty much ending san francisco's movie aspirations <laughs> the movie industry could have been split between san francisco right. and los angeles but they, they had their people up there like, hey if they want fog if you want to if you love your fog so yeah, much you, love you your can't fog have so movies much. you love all your seagulls in every shot I've been there. I get it. They didn't make another movie there till Dirty Harry. <laughs> <laughs> to help promote LA as the film hub, the LA Times launched the first motion picture page in American journalism. It was called Preview, which grew eventually into a Sunday section. He also added a columnist devoted entirely to Hollywood gossip, which is just like, did you hear what Mary said? Because there's only like three people. Inside. This woman was went by the name Stella Stargazer. In 1917, General Otis passes away. Marion and Harry published his deathbed statement for the Times and for the city. It was the fundamental injunctions on how the co-heirs should assume the high trust and valuable property of the LA Times. I'm going to read his dying thing. So this was Harrison Gray Otis's letter to to Harry and to Marion. Which but also he, sounds like their names, by the way. Yeah. Oh my God, it does. <laughs> Should I read it in old timey voice or dying old man voice? Make sure your throat hurts a lot after this. You know, and will always <laughs> bear in mind the paramount fact that this journal is and must continue to be first a newspaper, a vehicle for the dissemination of current news and reports and information, a faithful recorder of the contemporaneous history of public affairs, of new knowledge, of the tremendous daily happenings of the mighty present all around the globe, no matter what nature or complexion the occurrence may be, provided they possess human interest. Moreover, the Times being a proper medium for thinkers, they will be given, as always in the past, impartial hearings in its broad columns whenever they are able to enlighten the world or contribute to those transcendent problems of human life, human living, and human government 
which, if they are to be wisely solved, will require the best thought and effort of the best men and women upon earth. Does that sound like Harrison Gray Otis at all? No. No, not at all. It doesn't sound like Harry Chandler either. <laughs> Who wrote this? In the columns of the Times will be found, I doubt not. By the way, he writes like Jack Kerouac. Like the first <laughs> sentence break is like six lines in. In the columns well, they were of the from the same town. <laughs> in the columns of the Times will be found, and I doubt not, in the future as in the past, graphic accounts of the doings of the far-flung human race, absorbing narratives of adventure and achievement, of research and investigation, of travel and discovery, of progress in the arts, sciences, and invention, of toil and triumph, of hardship and endurance, and ultimate success, of everything, indeed, that is new to men and living interest. The press is a colossal surveyor of the worldwide news field, scanning the entire civilized globe and faithfully purveying to an ever-waiting public the luminous record of daily and might happenings among men and nations. Uh, he doesn't do that. I don't know what he wanted from that letter. <laughs> I don't understand what he was saying. Just the thing about, like, everyone gets their fair story. Like, doesn't sound like anybody no. who's in charge. Now, Harry's in a comfortable position. He's doing well financially. And here's where he starts becoming the father of modern Los Angeles. What drives the city forward is what most people in Los Angeles are trying to get rich on. Boosterisms, mm -hmm. as I call them. Here are some of the things that Chandler was involved in. The water supply of Los Angeles, you talked about a little bit. The aviation industry. Hollywood, both as the film capital of the world and most important to him, real estate. He missed the train on oil, unfortunately, when he got offered Signal Hill for dirt cheap and he declined, not knowing that there was black gold under that <laughs> dirt cheap. So now it's 1920s and we stayed on this podcast before. This decade saw a huge boom in the population of the city, reaching the million for the first time. It was a boom era for the LA Times as both in circulation and advertising and the paper started growing rapidly. For three consecutive years, 1921 to 1923. It's a lot of erection pills. A lot of boners. It was a town of boom and boner. <laughs> <laughs> three consecutive years, 1921 and 1923, the LA Times led all other newspapers in the United States in both volume of advertising as well as classifieds. Wow. Well, I mean, that's that's not like... That's not that's editorials. Not, no, yeah, that's, that's not, not like, story, like hard pride, hitting stories. Really. Yeah. We advertise for more Mormon bishop pills than any other city <laughs> in the nation. We have more people looking for love in our back pages than any other place. We have the biggest population of people who aren't virile. Los Angeles, the city of impotence and loneliness. The city paper continued to increase its effort for a better city and state, advocating better transportation system. They boosted agricultural methods. They helped to achieve things like building of the Colorado River Aqueduct and the development of Colorado. Of, they developed Caltech around this time. He took an active role in supplying the city of Los Angeles with water, as we know from you talking and you talking the last time too. The aqueduct was thanks to the drive of William Mulholland, but it was the syndicate which was led by Otis and Chandler and railroad tycoon H. Harriman who purchased the water rights. They were behind that. The Times also garnered support from the public to supply LA with water, specifically San Fernando Valley, which Chandler owned a great deal of stock in, which is why they wanted to bring water yeah, to we it. We covered this. Chandler, yeah, I know. I just He was behind that. Like He, he yeah, helped. This is the, the face. The we're, face. We're, the fathers of all this stuff. Yeah. Now we talked about Hollywood as an idea, but what about Hollywood as a real estate? Remember from episode mm. 29, a landmark episode, it was Harry Chandler and one of the many <laughs> fathers of Hollywood, H.J. Whitley, they were trying to promote the area in Hollywood known as Whitley Heights, which Chandler had invested in. To help promote this area, they built a large sign to advertise the real estate, and thus the Hollywood Land sign was born, which was owned by Harry Chandler in the early 20s. <laughs> Harry Chandler's Hollywood Land is what I originally said. <laughs> Harry Chandler Harrison met, Gray Hollywood. In the early 20s, Harry Chandler met with a young aircraft engineer through columnist Bill Henry. This man was Donald Douglas, and he arrived in L.A. with $600 in his pocket, carrying orders from the U.S. Navy for three three experimental torpedo planes. He needed to bankroll this little war endeavor, so he contacted his pal, Bill Henry. Chandler met Douglas and understood inherently that LA needed more business enterprises. He saw that Douglas was far too shy to drum up enough money from these fat cats, so he helped Douglas and Bill Henry get in contact with the head of Security Bank, and from there they got a loan with some other money, and with that, Douglas Aircraft was born in Los Angeles, with three planes finishing in a tool shed downtown. The Navy then ordered 25 more, and then the aviation industry was born after after that in Los Angeles anyways no they invented flight this should be said he had no interest in movies he had no interest in planes or mechanical devices at all he didn't like them he had a great hatred for cars he like eventually learned how to drive and was okay at it and with it but early on in his driving he would yell whoa at the car <laughs> like it was a horse and he was trying to get it to stop where are the reins on this thing <laughs> he was like putting carrots in the, in the gas tank the horn in front <laughs> nevertheless he still pumped money into the Southland's auto industry either having a grand vision for a sprawled out city or just seeing early on that cars weren't going anywhere because technology does not go backwards. Uh, he pumped money into the auto and tire factories and oil ventures. He invested in Goodyear Tire and Rubber Co. He backed companies drilling for oil. Bill Boyarsky wrote in his book, Inventing LA, which I read a lot of, that oil, the automobile, and real estate were all intertwined.
intertwined and Chandler and the city profited from all of it. He made money from the sale of cars, tires, and gas to motorists shopping for homes of their own. When they headed into the valley, they headed to towns and subdivisions on land owned by Harry Chandler and his partners. I know we strayed from LA Times, but this is a good time to get into Harry Chandler and real estate. He had- Liked it. <laughs> I didn't mean to take us on a detour there, but but he liked it. he liked it. His true love, his big cartoon hard eyes love, was for <laughs> land. He really wanted land. He lo- he wanted to own it. He wanted to cut it up, and he wanted to sell it. He's a true Spanish conquistador when it comes to this. Conquistador. Conquistador. The land needed to be watered, which is why he brought water to LA. But this monumental city-making element, being water, was only an accessory to the land he sought to own. Even oil didn't really interest him. But early on, he had his eye set on the San Fernando Valley. Even from his humble beginnings when he walked into Coinga Pass into Van Nuys Ranch and he just saw all this land from there he wanted it. His daughter May recalls Harry saying that he foresaw the San Fernando Valley being jam-packed before you girls die which is a weird way to put it but fine part of his desire for land was obviously and you will die and you will die in front of me i will see it i will be by my hand part of this desire for land was obviously profit harry chandler sought to turn large parcels of land into money to meet the times payroll after any kind of land boom bust any land bust that happened and he wanted the money to bankroll so he needed the money but also he just wanted to he liked to play this game. He'd buy it up and sell it whenever the Times was aching for money on top of many other reasons to just want the money. That seems unethical at the least. It's the least unethical. It's really shoddy. He's like a land tycoon. Yeah. Super shady. And this man founded the city. Um, <laughs> and if he were a drink, he would be... Mm. A nails marinating in water. <laughs> I invented that. Every time he wanted to do any venture land-wise, he'd form a syndicate with a bunch of other rich people and they would go into a venture together. He formed a syndicate and wisely invested money in the area between... This is weird. Between Baja, California and Tejon Ranch, which I believe is like up to 405. 27,000 acres, which doesn't sound right. But he made a deal with Dick dictator yes. Porfirio Diaz, which was a key figure in the Mexican mm-hmm. Revolution. He bought land on both sides of the border. They built 2,500 miles of canals and turned the acreage into one of the largest cotton plantations there is. But the land was eventually confiscated by the governor of Mexico. So then Chandler, trying to regain the land, apparently tried to arm an expeditionary force that would overthrow that government. <laughs> but they were caught and they had to go before a grand jury in 1915, but he was eventually exonerated. So he tried to overthrow the Mexico. Not Mexico, but whatever group, to, like the governor or whoever took over his ranch that him and the syndicate bought, he tried to get a force, a little militia together to take it back. Just the ranch he wanted back? No idea. <laughs> but I imagine just the ranch. I'm sure Harry Chandler can't lead an army against Mexico. <laughs> no, but Harrison Gray Otis could. <laughs> nah, you're, you're absolutely right. I've got one more war left in me. <laughs> Anyways, the Valley. Chandler formed a real estate syndicate with Moses Sherman, whom I'm trying to remember how we know that name. How do we know? Are you really asking how we know that name? Moses Sherman. Sherman Way? Sherman Oaks? What ventures was he in? Was he a <laughs> railroad guy? That I don't remember. Okay, I, that's I, what, I, that's yeah. what I'm trying to wonder. You know, it might have been railroads. I think I it think was. he was a railroad guy. Anyways, okay. Moses Sherman, General Otis, Whitley of Whitley Heights from Hollywood. This group formed the Suburban Homes Company. They purchased Porter Ranch in 1905 and most of the holdings of Van Nuys and Lancashire families in 1909 for about $2.5 million. They subdivided the 60,000 acres into the residential industrial property, which sold for $17 million over a seven-year period. The 22-mile-long paved highway they built, Sherman Way, connecting the (laughs) development with Los Angeles is said to have... How do we know that name? Connecting the development with Los Angeles is said to have inspired the county to vote a bond issue for paved roads, the first issue for that purpose in the United States. We... They how does Sherman Way roads. connect to the to Los Angeles? Probably before the airport was there, it went all oh, the way to Los Angeles. Okay. I mean, think about San Fernando Road going all the way down. Yeah. Sherman Way doesn't do that, but San Fernando Road does. Most of the San Fernando Valley was annexed to the city of Los Angeles in 1915 when Harrison was still alive before Harry Chandler was in a big position of power, but he was definitely behind a lot of this stuff. Owning the land drove Chandler to boost for Los Angeles so he can sell it, and the Los Angeles Times is his microphone for that. <laughs> in the 1930s, they organized another real estate syndicate which bought the estate of Lucky Ball. Baldwin, covering mm. areas that would become subdivided into Santa Anita, Arcadia, San Gabriel, and the Baldwin Hills. Mm. This guy's all about yeah. owning Los Angeles. All of the minor heroes of the city, he bought them all he, out. Yeah, he, he exactly. He amalgamated yeah. them. Anybody that he can't buy, he'll just join the syndicate with. <laughs> Harry is for sure at least partly responsible for many industries in Los Angeles, but let's not forget another legacy he left behind, being a huge dick. Greg, that's not language we use. We call them boners. Boners <laughs> here. He was the acknowledged leader. He's the human bishop pill. He was the acknowledged leader of the Southern California's conservative Republicans, which meant the LA Times was full of booster ads for Southern California calling it America's great white spot. Mm. There it is. There it is. <laughs> it also meant that the paper heavily endorsed Republican candidates that Chandler favored and gave very little attention to Democratic options. And this is when Republican was becoming 
Republican. Republican. <laughs> Republican meaning, who are you? How'd you get here? The who are you? How'd you get here party. Although he paid higher wages than going union rates and gave incentives to employees such as honoring seniority and seldom delay people off. Very anti-union. Very right. anti-labor. It was rumored that Chandler would push for a Sunday column that ran from 1935 to 1941 called Social Eugenics. Ooh. That meant something different back then, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, please you, say it meant... You know, 1935, <laughs> I think it's at the heart of the word eugenics. Yeah, that was the golden age golden. of the word eugenics <laughs> the column argued for stronger sterilization laws and Ooh. railed about how society's misfits should not be allowed to procreate every sunday yeah but this was not racial eugenics like what hitler proposed oh, well, then it's fine but it was <laughs> certainly in the same league of thought it's like one thought away from being like and you know uh who's the real bums <laughs> but not and just misfits anybody. yeah he allowed this column to be published he was part of the i forget what the group was called but they were very into eugenics the german-american bund <laughs> it might have been the silver shirts remember when i was talking about Tugan Davis and I said you know how bad he was based on who his enemy was which was Clifford Clinton. Harry Chandler's enemies included but we're not limited to Upton Sinclair author of The Jungle. The Jungle if you don't know class A muckracking journalism which aimed at exposing the putrid and nightmarish conditions of the meat packing industry a real progressive novel. Chandler hated him. They led a campaign against him. He hated William Randolph Hearst well, who, citizen, who, didn't. who didn't publisher of the San Francisco Examiner and Citizen Kane is partly based on him. Listen to the intro for that. I don't get it. What, what's Citizen Kane? What's that? Some sort of cane? You ever heard of a sled before? <laughs> His other enemy was Clifton's pal, Mayor Fletcher Bowron, who helped mm. stamp out corruption Good in City guy. Hall, which is another thing about Harry Chandler. He was pro-corruption. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but he certainly knew the deal between political fixer Kent Kate Perrot and mm. his installation of Mayor Cryer. Like, they knew about it. Like, mm -hmm. Chandler was okay with this. He certainly supported Jim Tugan Davis. And let's not forget that Chandler fully supported when Jim Tugan Davis and the goons posted up at the state line and were turning migrants away, looking for work with guns, threatening yeah. to arrest them. This was endorsed by the LA Times. This was the LA Times of the era. And speaking of the 30s, in 1935, a truly beautiful thing happens. The new headquarters, or at least part of it, was opened at First and Spring Street next to City Hall. And it was, is, was an Art Deco miracle. It's so beautiful. And it's, it was only, what, across the street from where the previous building was? Cat a corner, I think, yeah. But a different corner than you think. Well, than I think. We all think the same way, right? We're Eugenics? Not. If you don't think that way, we should probably talk about social eugenics. <laughs> it was designed by Gordon Kaufman, who was responsible for designing Greystone Mansion, Ooh. Caltech, the Boulder Dam, the Hollywood Palladium. Yeah, that, is that, that's in Calder, Cal, Calderado. Calderado. <laughs> yeah, Boulder Aldo. And he also de designed Santa Anita Park, which I went to recently. And it is a, That park is astounding, and it used to hold Japanese people. <laughs> we went on a tour of the building, not to digress or anything. but yeah. In its dying days, and we took a tour of the, the building. the last week that it was going to be. Yeah. Like, I wish we had more of this context, but it was still pretty cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I'm pretty cool. Uh, there's no proof of that. Hours and hours of this podcast and there's still no proof of that uh, <laughs> we'll find it we'll get there <laughs> this is part where he didn't say anything also in 1936 the times pioneered in becoming america's first streamlined newspaper using linotype machines which cast line by line instead of letter by letter which is what monotype machines were they were one of the first ones to do this they also used the largest body type of any metropolitan newspaper i got the largest body type right here <laughs> <laughs> finally it happened <laughs> cool cool guy <laughs> harry chandler retires in 1941 and he dies of a heart attack in 1944 harry stipulated that after his death all records of his business and personal information were to be burned including in this was his business correspondence with notes contracts and other records of how he built the city the newspaper and the incalculable fortune we lost to history super shady burn it with this sled also <laughs> weird it's, guy there's a weird thing where he doesn't like to talk about business ventures outside of professional things and when he dies that also goes like, i don't know he seems like a weird guy there was a picture i saw that was like the a uh, family portrait of the Chandlers yeah and they're all there and then he's off to the right like a, like a visual space between them yeah a visible space between not just him and his family but him yeah. and his wife also detached it's yeah very weird he's a weird guy awful but the founder of the city but awful 